Hello, everybody. Provi here. So we're going to continue on with our discussion of cells, and we're going to pay specific attention to, in today's lecture to reviewing about the cell walls of both prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells, and then looking at the plasma membrane of prokaryotic cells, and then spending a significant amount of time talking about the plasma membrane of eukaryotic cells. So let's get started. So if we think about this for just a second, right? Um, if we look at the morphology of these organisms, right? The prokaryotes and the eukaryotes, we re recall that prokaryotes are smaller and they don't really have a nucleus nor any membrane bounded organelles. Um, and eukaryotes have a nucleus and they're much bigger. And if we think again, phylogenetically or the evolutionary history and how everything's related on the planet, there are three domains, right? The bacteria, the archaea, both of which are prokaryotic, and then the eukarya, which are eukaryotic. And if we look at those two cells, right, you can see that the bacteria are much more simple in design. And when they are simple in design, what that means is they don't have a lot of the internal structures that eukaryotic cells have. So a lot of their structures have to do multiple roles for the, for the cell itself, where the eukaryotic cells are much more complex, right? So you can see they have all these structures of which we've talked about quite a bit already. And we're gonna continue to talk about some of those structures as we go through our course. If we look then at the uh, prokaryotic cells, right? I talked about last time we met, or last time we talked, about the cell walls. It's really their, in most cases for bacteria, it's their protective outer layer, right? Some have an additional layer, but mostly um, for the bacteria, it's a cell wall. And um, almost all of the prokaryotes have a cell wall. Some don't, but almost most of them do. And if we look at the bacterial cell walls and the archaeal cell walls, they are composed of really tough, fibrous material, right? And that cell wall surrounds the, the plasma membrane of the archaea and the bacteria, but um, they're constructed of, of different types of carbohydrates. And so the cell walls of of bacteria and the archaea have a different biochemistry, right? And so then there, we can we can look at them and study them and know why they're different, right? So of those particular um, organisms, the bacteria, and we're going to concentrate now on just the bacteria, not really talk about the archaea too much, but we classify them clinically uh, and medically. Um, we classify them as gram-positive or gram-negative based on the composition of their cell walls. But we use the tool, the gram stain, to differentiate them, right? So gram-positive cells appear purple and gram-negative cells appear pink or red, uh, but that's because of the way that the staining method is developed so that we can all be talking one language when we are, when we are talking to each other or talking to other groups of scientists all over the world, when we say gram positive and gram negative, we're all talking the same language. And therefore, um, even though gram positive cells appear purple and gram negative cells appear red, it's really the construction of their cell walls. And what I mean by that is that if you look at the cell walls of gram negative and gram positive, they both have what we call a peptidoglycan layer, right? And this is the way this is the way you spell peptidoglycan, right? And peptidoglycan just simply means chains of sugars, right? And so you can see with the gram positive, they have a really thick peptidoglycan. And that is what constructs them completely, right? That's all they have. This is the plasma membrane, right? Not part of the cell wall, but this is a cell wall of gram positives. And those cell walls of gram positive cells are composed only of carbohydrates, a peptidoglycan layer. When we compare them to the gram negative cell wall, again, this is a plasma membrane, not part of the cell wall. But from here, 
to here is the cell wall of a gram negative cell. Now you can you can appreciate that it does have a small peptidoglycan later, roughly it's about an eighth the size of the gram positive, but it's constructed the same way, right? Carbohydrates. And then it has an outer membrane that we call the lipopolysaccharide layer. And that makes the gram negative cells much more flexible because they have these, this lipid layer, right? This phospho, uh, this uh, lipopolysaccharide layer, right? Composed of phospholipids, right? Uh, and it's part of its cell wall. Where the gram positive cell wall, because it only has carbohydrates, right? It's fairly rigid and, and doesn't bend as well. Okay. So that really tells the difference very quickly between the two types of bacteria, right? Gram pos and gram neg. Uh, and now we're going to talk a little bit about or review a little bit about the plasma membrane for prokaryotes. And then we'll go on to talk about eukaryotic cells. So all membranes, whether they're prokaryotic or eukaryotic, are constructed of a phospholipid bilayer. And so if you'll remember from our talk about uh, macromolecules and types of lipids, right, this um, phospholipid has got a phosphate head, right, right here, and then it's got a lipid tail. These are long chain, long chain fatty acids that make up these lipid tails. And the lipids like to mix with each other, but they don't like to come in contact with water. And the phosphate heads do, uh, can come in contact with water, right? And so if we look at the way that the plasma membrane is constructed with, <clears throat> with bacteria, you can see if you were to follow my, um, my little drawing here, I'm essentially dividing the phospholipid bilayer of this plasma membrane into its two leaflets, right? So, excuse me one second. <laughs> um, and so, if we think about that, then I've divided this plasma membrane in its two, into its two leaflets. And so you can see that um, how the lipids are attracted to each other, right? And so they make up the inner part of the membrane, but the phosphate heads are making up the outer boundaries of the plasma membrane, right? If this is the outside of the cell and this is the inside of the cell, you can see that it is the phosphate of the of the phospholipid bilayer that comes in contact contact with with fluids, right? Either the extracellular fluid on the outside of the cell or the intracellular fluid on the inside. Of a cell. Now remember, I told you all that um, the plasma membrane of bacteria, right, the only membrane that they have, um, has to do multiple functions because they don't, the, the bacteria do not have any organelles. And so if you look at these, right, the functions of the prokaryotic plasma membrane is number one, it regulates what comes in as nutrients, but also regulates what leaves as a waste. It's the site of cellular respiration. So it is the site where the electron transport system is located uh, in bacteria, right? It's the site of flagellar attachment, right? And it really aids in powering the, in the, the flagella itself because of the gradient that is formed. And then lastly, uh, it aids in the distribution of genetic material when the bacteria are dividing because bacteria do not have a nucleus, so they cannot undergo mitosis. So they undergo a type of cell division that we call binary fission, right? And, and so you can see the multiple roles or functions that the plasma membrane provides for the bacterial cells, okay? I always like to show, um, electron micrographs of what we're talking about because I want people to see. And so here you can see the cell wall of this particular um, cell. And then here is the plasma membrane or this, they call it the cytoplasmic membrane. That's the same thing, okay?
Um, if we then transition to talk about uh, eukaryotic cells, right? Um, so there are a few types of organisms that have cell walls that are eukaryotic. And if we think about that for just a second, here we go, we have plants, right? And then we have fungi molds or the macroscopic fungi, and then we have algae. Now, one of the main constituents in all of these three different types of organisms, cell walls, of course, is cellulose. As a matter of fact, in plants, it is the major, it is the major sugar, right? In fungi, um, both molds and mushrooms and things like that, it's cellulose and or uh, a, some um, portion is made up of chitin, right? Another, another polymer of uh, glucose. And then in algae cells, you have cellulose, and then you have a little bit of silica, and then you have a little bit of calcium carbonate, right? And therefore, if you think about this for a minute, uh, because of the silicon, right, um, glass is made out of silica also. And so if you think about diatomaceous earth, right, diatomaceous earth is just mostly the, the dead bodies of diatoms which if we think about it, then if they have silicon, then we can use diatomaceous earth around our house. And if we use it around the house, when the pests try to come in, fleas and roaches and things like that, the, the diatomaceous earth will cut them and they'll die, right? So then you have less pests coming into your house. And it's a really great way to control pests uh, because of the silica that's found in those diatoms and it doesn't really hurt any other organism. Um, and it's non-toxic at all. So this is a really great way to use a biological end product, uh, dead diatoms to really control pests um, in your household without using any kind of chemicals, right? And that's a pretty nifty thing to think about. Okay. As we go on to talk about cell walls, you can see how the cell walls, especially for those of plants and some fungi and, and really some algae protozoans, right? You can see how they're arranged, right? And so they tend to stack on each other and this gives great support to the plants, right? And there can be uh, layers of these particular cells, right? The way that they're constructed, right? And so you can see that over a period of time, you have these secondary or tertiary layers of these cell walls that form around some of these plant cell walls. Okay, so we're mostly going to be interested in talking about the plasma membrane because it is involved in a lot of a lot of uh, cellular processes um, and we're going to be spending most of our time talking about the eukaryotic um, plasma membrane. And so again, if you look at these micrographs, you can see the plasma membrane uh, and you see this is a bacterium it has a nucleoid, right? And so you can see the different kinds of colors that have been added to enhance our understanding of how these, how these cells are put together, right? And so it's really interesting to see how these things are put together. Again, if you think about, um, there's, a, there's this, theory of, of, that we talk about, we call the fluid mosaic model, fluid, fluid mosaic theory. And that really basically says that the, um, the plasma, the cell membranes are really composed of all kinds of different uh, types of macromolecules, right? They're composed of phospholipids, right? Uh, they're composed of glycolipids, proteins, and sterols. Remember, the sterols, the cholesterols, are only found in animal cells and not really associated with any other cell, just the animal cell. But if we think about the way that the, the way that the membranes um, can be formed, right? They typically form uh, in an arrangement where the, the lipids like to uh, come in contact with each other, but they are what we call um, hydrophobic and so they don't like to come in contact with water. So when you have these membranes form, you can see how they're forming 
right? And so you can see how these things, sometimes a drop of oil will do this also, right? Soaps work in the same manner, right? So the soaps are gonna be attracted to themselves first and then part of the soap is gonna be attracted to water. Right? And so they form these kinds of coverings that you see associated uh, with these droplets of, of oils or things like that when they're in water, right? Because they are attracted much more to themselves than they are to water, uh, where they're not really attracted to water at all. Right, and so if we think about this, then the plasma membrane um, is constructed of a phospholipid bilayer. The phospholipids make up the largest portion of the, of the plasma membranes, right? And we're gonna be looking at eukaryotic cells, mostly from here on out, right? There are proteins that are embedded in the membranes themselves, and we'll look, up, we'll look to see how they're constructed in just a little bit and how they're put into the actual membranes. But you can see them here. These are proteins that are embedded in the membrane themselves, right? Again, an electron micrograph showing um, how these really complicated cells are put together. And so this, of course, you can see the plasma membrane here on the outer surface, right? It's an animal cell. And then you have all these other internal structures, all these organelles, the nucleus, right? You can see the Golgi apparatus right here. And then you see several mitochondrial structures here. Here's a lysosome. And we've talked about all those before, right? But this is just a beautiful image of what the, what, um, what an electron micrograph, this is a transmission electron micrograph, what they can help us or inform us, right? So that we understand the cell a lot, uh, a lot better. And so again, eukaryotic cells are plants, animals, protists, and fungi. And they have different, they, have, they may or may not have a cell wall, right? So of course, uh, the fungi have cell walls, right? And the plants have cell walls. Some protists can have cell walls, but animals never have a cell wall, but they do have a plasma membrane. And so that's what we're gonna mostly be talking about here. So again, if we think about the fluid mosaic model, remember the fluid mosaic model says that the membranes are constructed of lots of different types of macromolecules, phospholipids, they got proteins in them, they've got cholesterol associated with them, they've got, they've got, um, different types of sugars attached to lipids and we call them glycolipids, but they also have different types of carbohydrates attached to uh, proteins and we call those glycoproteins, right? And then you can see uh, the, the statoskeletal um, elements that we, we talked about before. So these, but this makes up, this phospholipid layer, bilayer makes up the plasma membrane and it's said to be semi-permeable, right? It's gonna allow certain things to come in but not everything can come into that particular, um, into the cell, unless it's either small, the molecule's small, it's uncharged, or it's lipophilic. Other than that, it can't come in, right? It, the plasma membrane will not let it come in. And so if we think about the construction of the plasma membrane of eukaryotic and prokaryotic cells, they're very similar in design. There are some major differences, right? And one of the major differences, of course, is the cholesterol molecule that we're showing here. That's only gonna be found in eukaryotic animal cells. This is one of my favorite images of a eukaryotic plasma membrane. It really shows how everything's put together. You can see how some of these kind of transmembrane or these integral proteins uh, can, can be channels, right? That can also be, uh, proteins that are kind of carriers. So there's lots of different functions that are occurring in some of these proteins. And we're gonna look at, at some of these proteins in a minute in a little bit more detail, right? But if we think about um, the way that this fluid matrix is that this membrane, right, is forever fluid. That means it's never, it's dynamic. It's always gonna be moving, right? And so it just kind of moves all the time, right? With the cell itself, right? And so because of that, because of that phospholipid bilayer, it's, it's very pliable, it can move, right? And so you can see how all of these different things that make up the membrane themselves, right? The, there are some integral proteins, right? The structural and supportive for 
um, for the membrane itself right here, right? There can be some peripheral proteins. There can be uh, some other kinds of uh, attachment proteins. There's lots of different functions of these proteins, right? And so if we look just really carefully, you can see how this membrane uh, can be um, can be constructed, right? And so the people use the term cell membrane and plasma membrane kind of uh, to mean the same thing. But to me and to a lot of other folks, a plasma membrane is a type of cell membrane. So cell membrane is really an umbrella, right? And not all the organelles that are membrane bound have membranes, right? But the plasma membrane is special. The plasma membrane is what defines the cell, right? It defines the outside of the cell, right? The outside of the cell and from the inside, right? So it's it's that particular it's that particular layer that really defines what the cell is. Okay. So as we go on to think about it, I, I just talked about the fact that the people use these two terms or these two phrases interchangeably, right? Plasma membrane and cell membrane, but there is a difference, right? The cell membrane is kind of a, a remember, a uh, an umbrella term, and then underneath it, you have other types of, of of types of membranes, right? And the plasma membrane is a very specific one where it really defines the cell. So in eukaryotic cells, right, the major function of the plasma membrane is uh, to separate the outside from the inside of the cell and then really to allow certain things to come in and then certain things to leave the cell. And the way some of those things come in or leave the cell is through the membrane itself, but if they're large, they're charged, um, or they're uh, lipophobic or hydrophilic, then they're going to have to come through pores or carriers, right? And so you can see their transporter pores or channels, right? And there are other types of proteins in here. Some of them are uh, enzymatically uh, tied to uh, a signal molecule, right? And so then something really great happens to the cell when those when those signal molecules come in. And we're going to be talking about cell signaling in, um, in, 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 another, in another lecture. And then you have anchor, right, where the tied to the cytoskeleton really adds support to the membrane itself. And so, again, um, because glucose and because glucose is too big and water is polar, right, uh, these things are going to have a hard time coming through, so they're going to have to come through some kind of channel or some kind of pore in order to get into the membrane itself, right? So remember, um, all membranes, including the plasma membrane, are composed of a phospholipid bilayer. And then there's proteins that are embedded uh, in that particular membrane. And those proteins have lots of different functions within the membrane itself, right? Here you can see how they might be embedded as an integral protein, right? And then also there are carbohydrates associated with both the lipids, right? We call those um, a glycolipid. And then there, you can see where uh, the, excuse me one second. You can see the carbohydrate attached to the lipid. That's a, a glycolipid. And then here's a carbohydrate associated with the protein, which would be a glycoprotein, right? And those have functionality too. And we'll talk about those in just a little bit. We've already mentioned about the fluid mosaic theory, and so everything is moving, right? Um, and it continues to move, it's dynamic, the membrane is forever moving, uh, and so you can see how it's constructed. The phosphate heads are uh, hydrophilic, they like to come in contact with water, and then the lipid tails are hydrophobic, where they do not like to come in contact with water. And so if we look at this, when, if you look at this under the PowerPoint, this is a PDF, these, this membrane will be moving for you, right? It's, uh, it's, show, it's trying, I'm trying to show you all the dynamic uh, movement of the membrane. And so this will be forever moving, right? And so you can see how these are the lipid tails right here and on the outside of the lipid tails. Uh, are the phosphate heads, right? 
And then some people believe that these that they can that these particular um, phospholipids can flip over. Um, a couple of papers have been written about that. I don't really believe that very much, but I want to tell you that some people believe that. I just haven't seen enough in the literature that says that they can flip flop like that. Now they can move like this, they can exchange this way, right? But they typically aren't gonna flip flop, right? Uh, although some people say that they, they, they do. The membrane is said to be semi-permeable, right? And so they're gonna allow some things to come into the cell, but most things are not gonna be able to come into the cell. And if we look at this, this is one of my favorite little uh, illustrations here, right? The things that can come into the cells uh, are going to be things that are hydrophobic. Another way to say that is lipophilic or nonpolar. They can come in, right? Or so there could be things like steroids, right? Or they're small, right? Like um, oxygen or carbon dioxide, or they're uncharged, like nitrogen, right? And so these things can come in, right? Um, and so you can see some of the other things that are polar um, or charged, right? Then they're going to have a hard time coming in. So water is not going to be able to come in unless it comes through a pore, right? And if they're large, like glucose, they're not going to be able to come in either. So here you see these ions here that are going to be basically uh, kind of sent away from the membrane itself unless they come through a pore itself. Okay. All right, so cholesterol is associated with the membrane because it supports the membrane, right? If the membrane gets, if the membrane gets too warm and it starts to loosen up, uh, cholesterol can stiffen it up a little bit. If the membranes start to get too cold then cholesterol can loosen up a little bit, right? And so it had this great value to the membrane and we all animal cells need cholesterol right now we do have some that are and that we construct ourselves but we get some of the cholesterol from our diets right we don't want to get too much because then we can have other problems with uh, arteriosclerosis and plaques being formed and things like that but you can see here what's being described is the cholesterol that's embedded in the membrane and it gives support to that particular membrane Okay, so animal cells have cholesterol, but plants do not have it. Although plants do have a stanol esters, right? And so they can have those associated with their plasma membranes. And the stanol esters are said to be protective, right? And so if you take some of those stanol esters, right, then uh, supposedly, uh, it can protect you from developing cardiovascular or heart disease. Okay. So the carbohydrates on the surface also act as name tags. And what they do is they allow for our, if, if you're an animal cell like us, we're multi-organ system, it allows our cells to be identified as being self. And so when we say that they're self, then the because of those markers, because of those carbohydrates and those proteins on the surface of our plasma membrane, then the immune system knows not to destroy them. That can work against us also, because if you think about it, cancer is something we really don't want in our body, but cancer is marked self, right? Because it's a mutated cell and it has the markers of being part of us, right? So let's say every single cell in my body is marked Felix with the exception of the red blood cells have a different marking system. But if I was to develop cancer, my, the cancer cells would be marked me too. And the immune system would know it's bad and it, would, it wouldn't really destroy it, right? One of the um, most diabolical um, viruses that's ever been, uh, has ever evolved on this planet is the um, HIV virus because the HIV virus, and so this is a very famous image, right? And so the little green structures are HIV, the pink structure is a T4 helper. And so the HIV cells are only attracted to and will only infect the T4 helper, which is kind of bad for us because the T4 helper 
is what really turns on the immune system, right? It sends signals, we call them cytokines. And these signals really turn on the immune system so that our immune system knows if there's something in our body that doesn't belong there. Well, if the HIV virus destroys our T cells so that we no longer have a, we no longer have very many T cells in our body, then we have what we call a uh, non-functioning immune system, right? When we're considered to be immunocompromised. And in that case, uh, we a lot of times get sick. People don't die from HIV AIDS. They die from some other opportunistic infectious agent or some other disease that's associated with the immune system not working. And that's what kills individuals, right? And so there's a whole science just to understanding how the HIV system attaches to some of these markers on our surface of our cells and it really tricks the cell and it enters the cell and then there's a lot of problems. So now for the most part, if you have a healthy immune system, every time you have an infectious agent get into your body, which is on a daily basis, right? Uh, infectious agents enter our bodies. We are on a constant attack, but we very rarely get sick. So think about that for just a second, right? Think about how many times you were sick last year, even with COVID-19, right? If you never have had COVID, uh, like me, I haven't. But how many times were you really sick? Maybe once. Uh, if I if I count if I count cedar season, I was sick once last some last last year once right so I have a pretty good immune system and the reason I have that good immune system is because uh, my immune system is working properly and all my cells are marked self so anytime anything comes in that isn't me my immune system attacks it and destroys it and therefore I don't get sick very often which is really great okay and so if we think about this then sometimes our immune system goes a little crazy and we can develop um, anaphylactic re uh, reactions to it, which go into allergic shock. That's what anaphylactic reactions are. And so you have to be really careful, right? I use cedar here because I am uh, very allergic, although I have been taking a, um, a sublingual vaccine. And over the last two years or so, for taking that sublingual vaccine, my body has become desensitized to the cedar pollen. So I don't have near the reaction I used to have, right? And that's really great to know. Now, whoever designed this, whatever you believe, right? Whether it's a, a deity or evolution or whatever, however we, however we were designed, right? They did a pretty good job of, of, of designing this because all of our cells are marked us, except our red blood cells have a different marking system. And therefore, as long as we cross type and match with other people, we can transfuse blood, right? Where it's different if we, if, if uh, let's say, um, Min and I are best friends and I have been really terrible to my body and my kidneys are, are failing and Min decides that she's gonna give me one of her kidneys and she's a good cross type and match, my body would still reject men's kidney because men's kidney is marked men and my immune system recognizes that those markers on the surface of the cells that make up that kidney are not marked me and so my immune system would attack it even though i cross type and match really well with with men's kidney my immune system still going to attack it because it's not marked that way therefore i would have to probably take immunosuppressants for the rest of my life in order to be able to live live whatever life I have with that new kidney, right? And that's what happened with my best friend, Bruce. He, um, he, 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 at age 30, his kidneys failed. He was diabetic and um, his sister was a really great match. And so um, she donated one of his kidneys to him and he lived another 20 years, but eventually, uh, from taking all those immunosuppressants all those years, he was, he was very, uh, he was, he was, and he, he could get sick very easily. Uh, and so over a period of time, you know, but 
the his body's immune system was really able to kind of not respond to the immunosuppressant drugs he was taking and eventually they destroyed his, the, the, his immune system destroyed his kidneys which then there was a cross reaction with the heart and so it destroyed his heart and he passed away at about age 45 because of diabetes and comorbidities associated with diabetes right? yep. that is a problem okay so i urge you all to develop really good habits uh, as a young person so you won't have to deal with diabetes although his was his was juvenile onset um you know a lot of people develop kind of um, intolerance to sugars and things like that and we develop uh, type 2 diabetes as we get older and become a little more chunky so we have to be careful with that as we go on to think about how that cell is to, is to, to is kind of put together remember that cytoskeleton that we talked about earlier and then we're going to talk a little bit about some of the proteins that are in them and and kind of the functionality of those proteins and uh, and then we'll talk about how things come across and we'll end uh, we'll end our discussion today with some problem sets of really osmosis and diffusion right so if we think about the idea that you that the membrane the plasma membrane is a phospholipid bilayer and there are all these proteins that have different functions on them and these proteins are constructed in a way that some of them have sugars attached to them they come become glycoproteins and there are glycolipids and we have all these different things and so we have these different types of proteins right we have channels uh, we have uh, carriers, right? We have lots of different proteins, right? This is a ribbon form showing the formation of a quaternary protein, right? And it's really cool that I can just say it's a quaternary protein and you already know what that is, but you can see how the channel is constructed and then you have a nutrient coming into that channel this way, right? And of course, this is the outside of the cell and this is the inside of the cell, okay? So there are some different proteins um, that I want you to know about, right? The adhesion proteins, right? Um, there are proteins that are found on uh, outward from the plasma membrane, right? And they um, they help the cells so that they can stick together uh, and form tissues, right? And that's important. There's communication proteins, and these communication proteins really can join. Uh, two different cells, right? And they can form these junctions that we have. And so some of these, some of these act this way. They can also uh, have signals attached to them and they can do different things um, for the cells themselves. There's receptor proteins and the receptor proteins really have uh, kind of what we call an epitope, right? An epitope. And an epitope is just kind of a binding site, right? It's a uh, um, it's kind of the binding sites within these proteins itself, and therefore the cell can um, secrete a protein, and that protein might actually attach to these receptor proteins, and then there can be something that goes on in the cell, right? We'll talk a little bit about that when we talk about cell signal. And then we can have recognition proteins, right? And they identify those cells as being self or or being whatever, belonging to the body, right? And so that's that's really an important type of function, right? So there are all these different types of proteins that play a role in the membrane itself, right? The channel proteins are especially important because they will allow certain things to come in, right? Um, and then we have carrier proteins that can also bring things in. And how does that work? Well, sometimes they need ATP, sometimes they don't, right? And so we're gonna talk about, about some of the ways those things work, right? And then if we look a little closer about, these are all signaling molecules. We're going to talk about them later, right? So you can see they have different shapes to them. They have different constructs to them. We call them ligands. Right? And then you can see that if this one was going to try to attach to that um, receptor protein, it wouldn't work. If this one is going to try to attach to the receptor protein, it's not going to work. But this one would fit very nicely in here. And when that attaches to that protein, something important happens to that cell 
and there's lots of things that can happen that are important, right? And then we, you know, we think about channel proteins and how different, different ions and either cationic or anionic can come through, right? And so really important to think about how that might work. And we're going to talk a little bit about them later on again. Um, carriers, right? As you can see, you, you can have different things come through the cell. And that leads us to our discussion about diffusion, right? So again, you have these channels and you have the ability of certain things to come into the cell and certain things to leave the cell based on a concentration gradient. So when we talk about diffusion, right, the, these molecules, if they're small, uncharged, they're lipophilic, they can come in through the plasma membrane unhelp, without any help. And they can go from the outside of the cell to the inside of the cell um, without any help. And that's going to happen as long as there's a concentration gradient. And what I mean by a concentration gradient, I mean that there's a higher concentration of whatever it is, whatever that molecule is, on the outside of the cell so that the, so that the molecules come into the cell to an area of lesser concentration on the inside of the cell. Now that works as long as there's a gradient, right? There is, there's no need to, for the cell to invest any energy because it's just going down a gradient, right? And so that's gonna happen. We call that passive diffusion or simple diffusion, right? And so that works all the time, right? Uh, as long as there is a gradient, right? Now there's another type of diffusion, right? And we call that other type of diffusion, we call it facilitated diffusion, right? And so it moves, again, sub, it's diffusion. It moves substances down a concentration gradient, but this time these molecules are either charged, they're large, or they're lipophobic. And so water is polar, right? It's not gonna come in, it has to come in through a pore. And so you can see these different things can come in. They're aided through a channel, through a carrier, because they can't go through the membrane itself because of the way it's, the, the membrane is actually constructed with these phospholipids, right? But it can go through a pore, right? Now, because it's diffusion, it does move down a concentration gradient from an area of higher concentration on the outside of the cell. It's a higher in concentration, right? So to an area, of lower concentration, right? This L or a little arrow downward in concentration, right? So the gradient will move from outside to inside. And in this case, it's using a channel, okay? So we call that diffusion, the movement of solutes. When we talk about osmosis, we're really talking about the movement of water. Now water will also move from an area of higher concentration of water to an area of lower concentration of water. And we call that osmosis. Now, if you're in a classroom and somebody puts on a really nice uh, smelling uh, cologne or perfume, right? When they put it on and they sit down, the people right next to them are gonna smell it immediately, but eventually through diffusion, you're gonna have that smell kind of go throughout the entire room, right? Because the molecules are gonna leave that person and go travel to areas of lesser concentration until really you have the same concentration in the entire room. When we talk about osmosis, we're talking about water only, right? And so water, um, it's, it's gonna to have to go through a pore, right? And so if we then think about how that might work, we have these things, or we have these, this term called tonicity, right? And we have these three terms, right? So tonic meaning concentration, hyper meaning higher concentration, iso meaning equal concentration, and hypo meaning lesser concentration, right? And so you can see if these are blood cells, and the blood cells are in a hypertonic environment, right? So there's much more solute on the outside of the cell than the cells are going to lose water and they're gonna shrink, right? And they're gonna become non-functional. If it's hypotonic, so there's lesser concentration 
in the fluid matrix that the cells are in and a higher concentration on the inside of the cell. Water is going to come into the cells, right? And if there isn't a mechanism to deal with that, then the cells will eventually burst. We try to maintain our bodies uh, through homeostasis. Now, we don't have any control of that. The body takes care of it. But just think about this, right? If you were to give an IV to a patient, you would never give them just pure water. You're going to mix that with physiological saline and maybe some glucose, right? But the physiological saline will allow for an isotonic fluid to enter the body. And therefore, when we say isotonic, we mean that the concentration on the outside of the cell is equal to the concentration on the inside of the cell. So there's a normal outflow and inflow of water and nutrients. And therefore, the cells maintain equilibrium, they maintain balance, and there's no, there's no effect on them, right? They don't shrink like they would in a hypertonic environment, and they don't swell as they would in a hypotonic environment, okay? So that happens in animal cells, but it also happens in plant cells, right? The same type of process. And so I'm gonna show you a video when we talk about osmosis of diffusion in lab uh, at some later date, I'll show you a video of what happens when cells, plant cells, are in an isotonic um, solution and then when they're in a hypertonic and, um, solution, right? So you can see that that happens with, uh, with plants all the time, right? So we call that turgidity or turgor pressure, right? And so here is a plant that's been sitting in the sun. It's lost so much water, you can see it's wilting, but all you have to do is just give a little bit of water to it down at the base and maybe sprinkle a little bit of water, right? During the hottest, part, the hottest parts of, of the summer, uh, in the mornings I'll go and I will freshen up all the plants on the outside in my garden. I will freshen up the leaves a little bit because they can take in a little bit of water that way, right? But, um, you know, there's a problem with, um, with uh, osmosis and diffusion at the grocery store, right? So if you, if you just leave the vegetables and the fruits just hanging out there, they're going to start to wilt pretty quickly. So the grocery stores deal with this problem by just having a little bit of a sprinkler come on, right? And so you, <laughs> you might be looking at, I don't know, uh, you might be looking at spinach or I don't know, some type of leafy vegetable and then all of a sudden you're looking at it and psh, the, the sprinklers come on and what that basically is doing is it's giving a little bit of water to the cells because they're still alive right and so they'll take in that water and then the the fruits and the vegetables will continue to look fresh and not look wilty because nobody wants to buy uh nobody wants to buy wilty produce right and so they deal with that by just spritzing. You can do the same thing at home, right? Um, if you've got indoor plants and they look a little bit, uh, they look a little bit wilty, you can just spritz them a little bit. And you've seen sometimes some people come around with a little spritzer bottle and just spritz the, um, um, the plants themselves. And then they kind of uh, become invigorated and they look really good. We talked about contractile vacuoles, right? Where we have, um, protozoans who have contractile vacuoles, and that's the way they deal with osmosis, because water is continuously coming into the cells through pores, and eventually so much water comes out, these contractile valves contract, and they remove the water uh, very efficiently so that these cells don't burst, right? So that movement of water and electrolytes allows for uh, electrochemical gradients to occur at tissues and cells. And so that plays a role in a lot of the physiological things that happens in cells. And if you take anatomy and physiology, you'll learn about some of those proton pumps and things like that. We're not gonna so much do that in this course, right? Because uh, we're really focused on some different things. But, uh, but I will tell you a little bit about how some of these protein channels work, right? So you have channels that have different names, right? Uniporter will allow uh, really one type of molecule uh, to come into the cell, right? And it's gonna go in one direction, okay? A symporter uh, allows two different molecules to come in, 
uh, but both are going the same direction. molecules to come in and out in different directions, right? Interesting to think about. So we've talked about diffusion, we've talked about types of channels, we talked about osmosis, and now I want to address uh, the active uh, transport mechanisms that we see associated with cells. Active transport just simply means that things are going to have to be actively pumped into the cell because these things are going to be pumped against the gradient. And so what that means is that the cell is going to bring in solutes or other nutrients into the cell, but it's going to be against a concentration gradient, right? And what that means is that there is a lower concentration of whatever solute um, or nutrient on the outside of the cell, and there's a higher concentration on the inside of the cell. And because of that, the cells are still going to bring these nutrients or these uh, electrolytes into the cell because they need them, right? Um, but they're going to have to pump them in. And because they're going to have to pump them in, uh, active transport uses has to utilize, uh, use up energy, ATP, in order to, have, to make this mechanism work, right? And so... So again, active transport is the movement of nutrients or uh, electrolytes against a concentration gradient from an area of lower concentration on the outside of a cell to an area of higher concentration on the inside of a cell. And because of this, because they're pumping them in, um, the cells have to expend energy, ATP, in order to have that happen. Okay, it's really important difference to know. So you can see how you can see the, the way that these might work, right? Where you have glucose, you have less glucose, right? Inside and higher glucose on the outside. And therefore they're gonna, uh, I'm sorry, you have, more, you have higher concentration of glucose on the inside and a lesser concentration on the outside and the cells are still gonna bring these in, right? Against that gradient, okay? Any uh, if you have any questions, let me know. Okay, there are other there are three other mechanisms of active transport. Um, well, let, let me do this. Okay, let me do this before we go on. So think of a bottle of water, right? You have a bottle of water, and you bought a bottle of water at H E B. And so, if you think about that for a minute, uh, this is not sterile water; it's just spring water or purified water or whatever. So even before you open that water, there is microbes in it, right? And so by law, by compendia, you can have 100 bacteria cells in there and still meet the requirements, right? Now, those bacteria cells in there are trying to survive, right? And so they're, they're surviving on whatever might be a nutrient in there. And that what might be a nutrient in there might be the plasticizer, right? They might be the stuff that's the plastics, right? So I think you guys have heard that... Um, you should never leave a bottle of water, plastic bottle of water uh, in your hot car because that'll warm up the plasticizer. The plasticizer will go into the water and then when you drink that, that potentially is carcinogenic. But the interesting thing is those bacteria in that water can utilize that plasticizer because it's nothing more than a bunch of carbon and hydrogen, right? And so if we think about that for a minute, then they're still gonna wanna bring those molecules into, the, into their cells but there's a, there's a concentration gradient problem because there's more, there's more nutrients inside of the cell than there is on the outside of the cell. And so they're gonna have to actively pump those in whatever, whatever those small amount of nutrients are. They're gonna have to actively pump those in. And that's the purpose of active transport, right? When there is no more concentration gradient, the cell will use active transport to bring those to bring those nutrients into the cell. Okay, there are some other uh, types of active transport, and we're going to talk about those now. One of them is phagocytosis, and with phagocytosis, you have certain cells in the body that can form a vessel around a non-self entity, uh, something that's bad for us. You can bring them in, and then they can destroy them, right? And so when they destroy them, then all the parts get liberated from the cell into the uh, 
uh, extracellular fluid, and then it, it gets cleaned up by the body, right? Phagocytosis, right? There's also uh, pinocytosis. Now, pinocytosis typically brings in small amounts of liquid uh, from the outside of the cell, right? Now, it can be a little bit of solute also, but mostly it's a little bit of liquid, right? And so when you bring this in, this these particular, you're going to see this vessel form. So you have this vesicle form because there's an invagination, there's an invagination of the plasma membrane, and then it forms this little vessel, right, with the fluid, and then it comes in, and then the cell can use that fluid or whatever that solute might be in small amounts uh, into the cell, right? Pinocytosis. It's a, a type of active transport. You have endocytosis, which now you're moving uh, solutes in, right? And again, you can see there, there's an invagination of the plasma membrane, right? Forms a, a vessel, and now you have your solute in there, and then the solute comes in, and then the cell can utilize those particular solutes or electrolytes or whatever they are, right? And then likewise, I mentioned when we were talking about the endomembrane system, about exocytosis, and so typically that happens with proteins, proteins that are made, but it can be other things. Proteins that are made, if they're not needed by the cell, the cell, these vessels can actually bind with the plasma membrane, and the cell will release this, whatever these materials are, into the extracellular fluid of the cells, where then it can be taken out by things, by our bloodstream, by our circulatory system, and be cleaned up. Okay, so pinocytosis, exocytosis, um, and endocytosis are all a form of active transport. And where we don't really think about phagocytosis, it is also a form of active transport. You're just bringing in a whole organism, right? And in some cases, it's quite dramatic to actually watch one of your white blood cells, once one of your one of your dendritic cells to engulf a yeast cell. It's pretty dramatic to watch that. I hope at some point you get a chance to see something like that, okay? So if we think about this, then um, you can have um, diffusion where you have small molecules, uncharged molecules or lipophilic molecules move in through the membrane and into the cell as long as there's a concentration gradient, right? You can have facilitated diffusion where now you have larger molecules, charged molecules, or lipophobic molecules that can come into the cell down a concentration gradient, right? Both simple passive or facilitated diffusion do not require ATP. And then you can have active transport where you're moving nutrients or electrolytes or whatever against a concentration gradient from an area of higher concentration on the outside of a cell to an area of lower concentration on the inside of a cell. But because they're pumping this against a gradient, the cells have to expend ATP. Right. So I know that in your homework, you're going to have a little bit of, um, you're going to have a little bit of problems with osmosis and diffusion, right? And so if we think about a couple of these, I want to do a couple of these with you all. Actually, we could do them all. It's not a problem. But if we, if we just think about these for a minute, so think about this beaker um, holding a type of solution and then the little round thing in the, in the middle is supposed to represent the cells. So if you can see here, then you have, when you have a combination of solute and water, they should always equal 100, right? So instead of a cell here, in this particular uh, example, you have 90% water, 10% solute, and then on the outside, uh, in that fluid in the beaker, if you will, you have 85%, 15% solute, right? So you always want to look to see where the higher solute is because write this down, water will always follow solute, right? That's an easy way to remember. So if you have 15% solute here and 10% there, then water is going to move from the cell into um, the, 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 the fluid in the beaker, right? And so because of that, where the water is moving towards the 
from the cell into the solution that's in the beaker, and therefore that's a hypertonic environment, right? And that's gonna cause the cell to shrink, okay? So that's the way I want you guys to think about each of these problems. Let's do this next one, right? So here, again, in the beaker, you have 10% solute, and then in the cell, you have 60% solute. So where's water gonna go? Well, water's gonna go follow solute where the higher concentration of solute is. So the water is gonna go, because the environment here has got less solute, right? It's hypo, right? So this is a hypotonic environment, right? And so if it's hypo, then water's gonna go into the cell and the cell is going to swell, okay? Let's do this one. So you have 20% solute here. You have 25% solute there. Where is water going to go? Water is going to move toward the higher concentration of solute. So it's going to move into the cell. And so again, you have, again, less solute in the environment. So this is a hypotonic environment. And the cell, again, is going to swell. Okay. Let's do this one. So we have 25% solute here. We have 55% solute there. So again, you have less concentration of solute in the beaker. So where is water gonna go? Water is going to go where there's a higher solute. So water's gonna go into the cell, right? And again, this is a hypotonic environment, right? and the cell is going to swell. Two more, 37% solute here, 10% solute here. What's the difference? Well, there's more solute in the beaker. Therefore, water is gonna follow solute. Water will go to the beaker, right? Water will flow out of the cell to the beaker. This is a hypertonic environment. And the cell is going to shrink. Okay. And then lastly, you can see there's equal amounts of solute and water in both of this. This is a perfect setup, right? So therefore, there's going to be an equal flow of water into the cell and out of the cell, along with solute, right? So this is an isotonic environment. Right, and so if we think about that, there's going to be no change to the cell, right? It's, it's there's no delta, there's no change. It's going to be perfect. It's going to be happy, and so therefore this is an isotonic environment, right? So um, if you would like, I can send you some problem sets to work on these. You'll have some of these types of problems on your exam. There's also some in the homework that you can practice on. Let me know if you want. If you have questions about this or you um, need some more practice, and I'll be happy to send you, I'll be happy to send you some problem sets. Okay. I, I do want to mention that a lot of our foods that we might buy at the grocery store are sold in a hypertonic condition, right? So think about this, right? All cereal is in a hypertonic environment, right? Especially if it's added sugar or dye, right? And so think about fruity pebbles or uh, fruit loops or things like that, right? That's a lot of sugar. Ever see any organisms grow on those? Nope, because they're a hypertonic environment. A lot of the uh, cold cuts, a lot of the uh, uh, lunch meat, the uh, 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 hot dogs, all those things, those are all hypertonic environment. If you read the label, you'll see that they, um, you see that they are mixed in with salts. And so a lot of times we'll salt meats because that'll, that'll produce a hypertonic environment and it won't allow bacteria to grow very easily. And so the food will be less likely to spoil, right? And then you have some of your canned stuff. If you look at that, like mackerel and some other fish are gonna be in brine, right? And the reason they put them in brine is they put it in a, in a salt solution. And the reason they put it in a salt solution is because that is a hypertonic environment. So if any bacteria in there, 
then the bacterial cells are going to lose water to the environment because there's it's a hypertonic environment. There's more salt in the actual brine in that in that uh, in that solution that that fish is in, and therefore the um, the bacteria are going to be less likely, even though it's sterile sterilized, they're going to be less likely to cause any kind of problems with that food, right? So we have the we have all these setups for us, and so a lot of times you buy even even dehydrated fruit, right, is a hypertonic environment because you remove the water from the fruit, and now the fruit, let's take a banana chip, right, and now the fruit is just nothing more than sugar. And so if you've ever seen any micro grow on a banana chip, they won't because it's a hypertonic environment. And that's really a great thing to think about because, you know, I always told you all that um, that the two things you should really get out of this course on a daily basis is number one, where do I stand in this course? How am I doing? And number two, why am I learning what we're learning, right? Because it all applies to everyday life, everything, right? And so the, uh, the one of the, the best scientists that are out there will be able to apply what you've learned here to everyday life. And that's what I want you all to be able to do is to use your knowledge to solve scientific problems, right? And so if you have any questions, let me know. You know, I always like to show you micrographs. And so here's some algae. These are light micrographs right here, right? So light micrographs. This is a scanning electron micrograph, which is really great for surface or topography. So you can see how these cells are arranged within this particular organism. And then this is a transmission, although not a very good one. But I wanted you to see the difference, right? Here you can just get a glimpse of what the organism might look like. Here you can see details on the surfaces of those cells. And then with the transmission electron micrograph, you can see internal to the cells, right? We'll continue on with our discussion next time we get together with looking at cell signal. I think you'll really enjoy that lecture. I enjoy talking about it. So um, let me know if you have questions. I'll be happy to address them for you. Um, you guys um, stay safe, right? This is the end of the lecture for the plasma membrane for osmosis and diffusion, right? So Pro-V out. Take care. Bye-bye.